any issues you want to raise before we start? Um, no, I just wanted to welcome everyone and uh, remind everyone that this is a public meeting and it's being webcast and will be recorded. Okay. Thank you. We're going to start a, this morning's meeting. Um, and uh, this morning what we uh, hope to accomplish is... Uh, a discussion uh, relating to uh, criteria that we hope to use in making our recommendations uh, to CPSC in terms of uh, various phthalates and phthalate substitutes in terms of uh, whether they should be banned, uh, put on interim banned, or uh, no action taken. Uh, and to begin that discussion, uh, Holger wishes to uh, review a couple of slides to start the discussion. So, second. So the, the first two slides refer to the presentations of Dr. Bückelheide and uh, Richard Sharp. And they are um, about the xenograph testis rect implant. Uh, and I had I have some thoughts on the on the applicability of the model. Uh, in terms of toxicity estimations. I asked both Dr. Bökelheide and Richard Sharp what they regarded as most relevant uh, for their model. And it was uh, Kim Bökelheide who said it's the area under the curve, so the active metabolite uh, of the phthalates, in his case it was the monobutyl phthalate. I have here data on the active metabolite of DHP. Um, we recorded blood levels of the active metabolite plus other oxidative metabolites of um, DHP way back in 2005 and published this in uh, Archives of Toxicology. You can see that in serum or in blood, MEHP is the main metabolite. So the active metabolite is the main metabolite in serum. So what intrigued me then is, is there any possibility to compare the active dose, that is the serum concentrations of the active metabolites in the different species. So in other words, what is the Cmax and the area under the curve after a certain dose in rats, in marmosets, in pigs and in the human. And as you can see from this slide here, we found that the area under the curve for the active metabolite MEHP is normalized to the dose much higher in humans than it is in rats by a factor of, I would say, 20, 10 to 20. So in other words, giving humans the same dose as rats, we would assume that the serum levels of the active metabolite over time is considerably higher in humans than in rats. And this concentration being the driving force for the experiments in the, in the rat testis implants, I think that uh, these rat xenografts give us a good idea on possible mechanistic issues but they certainly have problems 
evaluating the level of toxicity because we have to assume that uh, we implant the human testes into the red metabolism. And the red metabolism produces less active metabolite over time than the human metabolism. So it's no surprise to me that when implanting the human testes into the red metabolism, it is less sensitive because the area under the curve, as can be seen here, is higher in the humans for the active metabolite compared to rats. So these are just some thoughts on the red xenograph models, and I think there's much more behind that model to be investigated. So that brings me to the third slide and to Dr. Klugel's presentation. Chris and me, we used the simple formula risk is exposure times hazard and I will show to you that uh, we can provide a reliable and good measure of exposure with the human biomonitoring data we have. The question, of course, is how to relate this exposure to the hazard. Of course, hazard times exposure makes the risk. So we need reliable toxicity data for the phthalates and or the substitutes in question. And we all agreed that we would focus on the reproductive toxicity data or the endocrine disrupting potency of the phthalates. So uh, I think for the three phthalates listed here, these are the three phthalates under permanent ban, we have reliable data to believe that these are endocrine disruptors, DHP, DNBP, and butyl benzyl phthalate. For the phthalates on the preliminary ban, we have heard yesterday that uh, we definitely have to regard DINP also as a reproductive toxicant having both effects on testicular testosterone levels and effects on the germ cells. So for DINP, we in the meantime have three results from three work groups. That's the oil gray group, that's the Boberg publication and now the Hemner Institute public um, presentation, which provide us with reliable data to assume that uh, DINP definitely is an endocrine disruptor and a reproductive toxicant. We also have reliable data for DIBP, which is not on the banned list, to regard it as an endocrine disruptor and a reproductive toxicant. So these are the Five phthalates, we have hard and reliable information to perform this quantitative risk assessment, multiplying exposure data with the hazard data. Regarding the phthalates DIDP and DNOP, we are, I would say, on a rather data poor side. So we have problems fixing a number to the hazard. And we have to decide here, I think, do we regard them as hazardous or not? That's the issue. And on the other side of the backbone scale, we have DEP, which seems from animal data to be non-active, but from epi data to be active. 
So there's ambiguous data there. And as we heard also yesterday, we cannot be sure that the animal model with the backbone activity between three and six carbons in the backbone might be of that relevance to humans. So this is how we are standing now. Uh, and these are all the points we have to take into account when performing our hazard index approach. So I think we first have to talk about the hazard. Can we quantify the hazard? Do we need to quantify it in certain aspects to then later be able to calculate our hazard index, which takes account of the cumulative exposure to all of these phthalates? So that was the introduction I want to make. Thank you, Holger. Any uh, response, comments to Holger's? Andreas? Just a little. Uh, can, uh, I found the um, uh, data with the area under calf you showed uh, very, very interesting. Uh, could you show those again? Um, just for the um, the both Kim Bockelheider and Richard Sharp used grafted um, tissues on the mouse, if I understand correctly. So, but we don't have other data area under the curve in the mouse. That's what I asked him because I think it is uh, it is it is mandatory to have information on metabolism if you transplant human tissue in this in this species mm. because the level of the active compound is the driving force and therefore you have to know something about the metabolism that's why I always ask them what do they know about the metabolism in mice or rats comparable to humans co compared to humans and we see that there might be considerable differences in in metabolism which might have an effect on the interpretation of the data but if I understood correctly uh, there was also another difference uh, Kim Buckleheide dosed with uh, DBP and Richard Sharp also had experiments where he dosed with uh, MBP, didn't he? But yes. Mm -hmm. Active metabolite, in other words. But your point is that uh, the, the unknown toxicokinetic factor in the mouse in these xenograft models might have obscured some effects, or at least it's sort of a, another black box whose content we have to guess. What this data is suggesting here is that uh, at same exposure levels, the level of the active metabolite in blood over time might be higher in humans than in, in the animal models. Which also goes to show, by the way, the how, why, why in the animal you have to use higher doses all the time. Not many people understand this. Uh, n another point you mentioned in your last slide that <coughs> DEP that there are that there's epidemiological evidence of of some effects. Uh, the, there there isn't. There, there's only indirect some indirect evidence. No one knows <coughs> what what DEP really does in in epidemiological studies. It's only there's only one hint. That's what I mentioned yesterday. That's why I feel <coughs> compelled to this here. There's one epidemiological study from uh, United Kingdom, Ormond is first author, carried out by Imperial College mm -hmm. London, where they found associations in the male babies from hairdressers with workplace exposures and cryptocritism hyperspadia, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. But the, the uh, DHP is a little on the spot, very indirectly, because we know we don't know precisely what the exposures are at these workplaces. There's also exposure to other things. Uh, no one has measured them, and it's terribly complicated to measure them. But by inference, uh, hairdressers use more uh, 
I mean, if you look at the profile of phthalates that make up the exposures of, of these workplaces, you will come to a conclusion very quickly that uh, DEP will dominate and not, not any of the other phthalates because of all the sprays and that sort of stuff. Russ, any comment? I uh, uh, agree, I guess, in terms of the discussion about uh, DEP. I mean, there, there was the, the paper Andreas mentioned, but also the associations that were seen in the SWAN study with reduced AGD. MEP was, was one of the metabolites. So I think it's um, important to consider as we go forward um, that the data in humans is, is sparse, but there's some there. So. But that's exactly the issue we, we are facing now with our hazard index approach, putting a quantitative number to the, uh, quantify the risk. So the first question we have to a answer is, do we regard all of these substances as hazardous? If yes, we might include them in the model, but we cannot give numbers to it, so we cannot take account of these phthalates. I would argue that the the charge asks us to to perform some uh, some risk assessment. We uh, we can only do this with to the standards described by by the state of the art in in this area. We've heard yesterday some uh, uh, exploratory studies, uh, very interesting, that throw a certain light on things. But uh, we have to bear in mind number one that these haven't been uh, published yet, they are not peer-reviewed. There are some questions, there are question marks about their usefulness. Well, they are definitely not useful for, for risk assessment because uh, they, fall, they weren't intended to, to um, make a risk assessment and they would clearly fall behind the standard of studies which you require for, for hazard and risk assessment. I think it is very helpful, interesting um, information to to keep in mind about the usefulness of some of the animal models. But I mean, we, are, we we have two choices: either on this basis of the evidence we heard yesterday, we conclude the uh, hazards and risks therefore are not quantifiable, which that, that's one option, or we say we proceed. Um, within the um, state of the art in the field. And my personal opinion would be to say uh, it is a little, it would be, uh, I think, a bit of an overreaction to uh, conclude on the basis of the information from yesterday that these uh, things are not quantifiable. Uh, there are exploratory studies and not even published. So, that, but that's just my personal opinion. And just to remind you again, both presenters were reluctant to advise us to change the TDIs or the reference doses we used, and they were reluctant to clear these delays of the suspicion that they might be endocrine disrupting agents. Well, and the other important thing I take home from this is the um, the 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 relevance of neonatal exposures, which. Um, wasn't emphasized so much uh, previously. Again, by, by undisclosed, undescribed uh, mechanisms, but uh, clearly neonatal exposures in these <coughs> models seem to, have, seem to have effects, which is, I think, very relevant to the charge we, ha we have to work with. Okay, I think that the slide that's up right now is a nice lead into um, our, our overall charge. Uh, it, I think it's clear that we have data that's relevant to the, some of the phthalates um, that we are charged to evaluate, but there are a lot of others that probably are very data poor, yet we have to evaluate and come to a recommendation. So 
um, I think it we need to have criteria that we use that are transparent um, for all of the others. So, um, Byrne put together a, a list of criteria that I'd like to have him lead a discussion on, and we've got some slides um, that we can use, and hopefully f with those and the discussion that ensues, we can come to some other criteria that we can use in our uh, discussions and uh, use to judge those other phthalates and phthalate substitutes. And so, Holger, would you give me the uh, mouse, please? Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Holger, <clears throat> for setting the stage, because I think you've done that well. Regardless of the state of information that we have, and regardless of the research activities that are going on that might be helpful down the road at some point, we are faced with making a decision with what we have in hand. And now we're coming close enough to the end of this process that we, we kind of stop the merry-go-round and we, we, we make the decision based on th the best we can with what we have in front of us. So I actually a couple of months ago sorted out in my own mind what did I think were the criteria that would be useful for distinguishing a decision to make a ban versus an interim ban versus no action with the thought that maybe someday we would have use for that in this committee, and maybe today's the day. But <clears throat> I have on this first slide <clears throat> some criteria that could be considered for making a ban. First of all, these are just my opinions, and I present this only for discussion, not that this is the menu that we need to, to reach agreement on or to follow. But these, these were some considerations that we, we would be looking at hazard, we would be looking at risk, we would be looking at exposure. And the fact that there are replacements potentially available in the wings out there that could be brought in is not a consideration for whether or not something could be banned. This isn't like a life-saving drug, where if there are problems with it, you have to decide what's the consequence of withdrawing that from the market because it's saving the lives of people. Well, that's not a factor for us here. I think we look at face value at the risk to people. So these were meant to be criteria that should characterize a chemical that we agree should be banned. And the hazard index could be equal to or greater than one. That would be one criterion. That the responses in key toxicity studies that are considered, the responses in the key toxicity studies are considered to be relevant for humans. And we're struggling with that. But the default has to be that, or should be, that we would consider them to be relevant for humans when we don't know otherwise. Thus, concern for human safety is plausible. The health effects expected or seen in humans are serious adverse health effects. So I'd, it raises the question of, you know, if you had a material that caused a rash in the skin, from dermal exposure, would you ban that chemical? And my suggestion is no. We, we want the consequences of leaving this in commerce to involve potentially serious adverse health effects. The key toxicology studies are replicated with similar results from multiple laboratories. So we would be more reluctant to make a decision if there was one study from one lab and it had never been replicated is that that's not a good basis for making a serious regulatory decision. Identity of the toxic agent in animal studies and in, human, in the human environment is confirmed with analytical methods of sufficient sensitivity, specificity, and limited detection in multiple laboratories. It's kind of the same idea of having one study from one 
lab, there, there needs to be analytical chemical confirmation that what we're worried about is actually what we think it is. And we can find it in a variety of media, whether it's air, water, food, cosmetics, toys, whatever it might be, but that we have, we're not going to be discredited six months down the road when some other analytical chemist says, oh, they banned something and didn't even know what it was because that we couldn't confirm it across laboratories or across media. So we have to be firm that the chemistry supports a decision and that we're not going to be undermined by making a decision, a decision based on toxicity when in fact, we were uncertain about the chemistry that supports what actually was there causing the problem. And also that levels of human exposure are sufficiently high to cause adverse effects. Again, that's part of the plausibility. Not only do the animal studies predict something that we think could be relevant for humans, but the human exposure is such that it gives us concern that maybe, maybe there is a relationship between exposure and an effect. So. I'm suggesting that if we review chemicals and we don't have this pattern of information, we probably don't have a sufficient basis for making a decision about banning it. That, that, that's setting a fairly high standard. But let me then talk about how different are the criteria for an interim ban. And I didn't back away very far. I, I think the same criteria need to be considered, but maybe not all of the criteria for banning have been met. And it's reasonable to expect that with more effort in the laboratory or in the field, that results would be available, could be available to determine if the substance should or should not be banned or should be restricted. So it, we haven't come up against a wall that says we would never be able to analyze this to determine biomonitoring, the, the possibilities are out there. The, the effort hasn't been made yet or the data haven't been collected. Maybe they're in sight, but we don't have them in a peer-reviewed mode or we don't have them replicated in another laboratory yet, but somebody's doing it, those kinds of considerations. So I, I see a relatively small distinction between banning and inter, interim ban and it's mostly a shortage of some data that perhaps could be collected if, if we were either waiting for it or we went after it. Then the, another factor here would be that additional survey samples to obtain to further determine human exposure might be needed and can be obtained in a timely manner. Then how how distant are we from those that we leave on a, on a list where there is no action? And I think we're fairly distant. The distance between an interim ban and no action is much greater than the distinction between an interim ban and a ban. And in fact, what I have on this one isn't quite correct because the, the criteria for no action is probably based on the lack of availability of data. Uh, tox data or exposure data, so then a hazard index couldn't be calculated because we wouldn't have no else. And the data are insufficient to characterize hazard and to evaluate risk. Exposure data may or may not be available. So there's a long list of chemicals out there that fall into this category if we don't have enough data to make a decision. But as Chris said, yesterday, and I say frequently, <clears throat> the absence of data is not the absence of risk. So it makes us nervous to have chemicals where there is human exposure and we have no, no data. But in the world of chemicals, <laughs> that's a long list of tens of thousands of chemicals. So it isn't unique to the ones that are in front of us, but nonetheless, when we're trying to put these phthalates or the substitutes in one of three bins, either to ban or to interim ban or to take no action, it is discomforting to know that there are a lot of them out there that if we just had the data, we don't know which bin they'd be in. But it's not a given that they would remain in the no action bin. Maybe someplace in between no action and ones that you think of from time to time is do we really, are we just waiting for a human effect to 
become observable in epi studies? Or are we confident that we could leave it in this no action category and that we wouldn't wish we had not done that someplace down the line? Funny how those are some thoughts about how, and address this is addressing your highly relevant question of yesterday, that before we begin discussions of what, what can we ban, what should we recommend to ban, uh, what should we make no statement about, I think we, we need to have some understanding and agreement between us on, on these criteria or other criteria. I just put these up for discussion. I've already talked maybe more than I should have, <laughs> but open for discussion. Andreas. Before we go any further with uh, discussing the details of your criteria, which I think are very helpful, uh, we uh, some time ago decided to go on a hunt to find out uh, why the three satellites in the text of the law have been banned permanently and why an intermediate ban has been put on the three others. What, is there any result? What criteria were used then to make these decisions? And I'm asking this to, because, uh, well, if there are some, we could probably borrow from them. But yeah. if these decisions have been made in the total absence of any rational criteria, then that's something worth noting and emphasizing as well, I guess. Yeah. So the question, I don't know, where were we there? Some, have we found out something? What led to the decisions then in the text of the law? Mike, can you share with us your feelings? Well, yeah. Um, I don't have a, a, a lot. There's not a lot in the record on that, and um, it, it parallels the... Uh, uh, the European ban, the, the six chemicals parallel the European ban. I think the uh, general uh, reasoning was that there is good data for the three permanently banned ones, uh, at least hazard data. For the other, for the interim banned ones, there is a suspicion of uh, hazard but the data were less convincing. I think that's probably the best uh, explanation one can give. Okay. That, that, well, I think that, that matches with, my, with my, uh, my own record and research of this topic. But uh, do we have any information uh, what led the uh, Europeans to ban those or put those salads in the frame. So that's the next, that would be the follow-on question. So if the criterion here in the U.S. that motiv motivated the inclusion of these salads was uh, to say, okay, the Europeans have done it like that, we're doing it uh, like the Europeans do. Uh, the next question is what motivated the Europeans? Is, is there any information on that? Well, uh, all... I have on that is the um, in the regulation itself it, it says something to the effect of what I just said is that the the three DIDP DINP DNOP the data were not convincing but they chose a precautionary approach in the face of incomplete data and I, I believe that was the, the logic Mike, another follow-on question to that. Are we constrained by the decisions that have already been made in the past? Well, um, it, well it's clear that the, that the purpose of the, I mean, they did the interim ban and said the CHAP will recommend on whether to make that permanent or not. That much is, is clear. If you mean, um, are you bound by any previous decisions by CPSC or previous CHAPs? No, absolutely not. We're certainly not bound by the European ban. Um, the, the only uh, th thing is the, uh, I think the permanent ban, if, 
if I understand correctly, is permanent. I'm not sure changing that would be a, an option. Mike, do you know the date of that ban and the interim ban? Uh, the date is was August of oh was it August or September of oh nine? It was the bill was signed. Uh, the the U.S. ban was signed by the president then um, in late oh nine. It seems interesting that perhaps to have two of the chemicals on the interim ban, but then there's still no more data. Uh, Certainly not a, not a lot more. There might be a little. I mean, there, there's this one paper that just came out that has a DNOP. On DNOP, that might be helpful. I haven't seen much on DIDP. NOP with that enough to have a reference dose? Uh, I, you know, I haven't read the paper. Um, I did email it to the chap uh, probably last week or so. Add some are we supposed to be discussing burns is that the right. is, is that what's on the agenda or did you want to do that more discussing I guess one, one point I might want to add, Vern, I think you, the way you've outlined it is very helpful, um, but one point I might want to add is um, the hazard index is going is oh. to change based on exposures, which evidently is going to change yeah. over time. Um, and I'm thinking we really probably should think about the fact that the ban took place in 2009, which really should have changed exposures in the biomonitoring. I mean, we're evaluating 2005 and six data. I think largely, I'm not sure how much, I guess we've got 2007 and eight, but I don't think the more recent data are available. Um, that's something to think about. I mean, I, I, that's, the, that's the, the issue of this that's, that's so, um, not just black and white. It's not like there's a dump site and we're saying here's the chemicals there and this is what we're going to make a decision on. I mean, these are things that are going to be changing and could I think could change very drastically based on decisions that have been made. As exposures yeah. go up, the hazard index, you know, some go up, some go down. It's Yeah. Um, just to clarify, what it was 08, August 08, when the CPSIA was passed and the phthalate bans were enacted. What we don't know is what industry expected to happen and if there were changes, you know, prior to that or. Uh. Well, I, you know, it's, it's a narrow, at that time, it's a narrow range of, you know, we're talking about toys and child care articles. So the, the CPSAA would only have affected those products. And, you know, I think the industry was gradually changing anyway. Even in, was it 2002 or whenever we last looked, I mean, there weren't that, there were less than half of a, the toys had DINP anyway. Um, as far as the other products, 
I mean, I don't know, but I think there's, you know, for things like cosmetics, there's been a gradual decrease in phthalate use. Uh, but other products in general, I, uh, it's hard to say. Um, as far as I know, I mean, there have been changes in uh, which phthalates are being produced over time. That has changed. But how that translates into exposure, I mean, you expect to see a change eventually. Um, I don't know what, so what years, I mean, have you looked at sets and Haynes data from different years? Uh, so far, it's just the 05, 06. I think yeah. we talked about going further, but I, I haven't had the time to do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we possibly could try to do that. It's just. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know what's the latest. But those are the latest data anyway. I'm not sure. 2007, 8, or the 09, 010, I mean, the 09. I think it's the same. We're, I mean, they've been publishing data from 07 and 08, I guess, up until 2010. I think we should wait with this, this discussion until we have the information from the external exposure estimates. What might be the significance of putting out the phthalates in certain products and leaving them in others? So I think with, with our approach, honestly, just taking it out from toys and child car articles, I probably think we wouldn't see much on what is currently known about the roots of exposure, of the roots of exposure. In the end, Haynes is children over six, so. But the pregnant women is what we were. Right, but, but still with child care articles, you wouldn't. Right. You know. right. So, but the whole point about the hazard index, you know, c using that, I think the hazard index could be a guide. I'm, I'm a little reluctant to say if the hazard index, I mean, we're thinking of a distribution of hazard. Criteria for no action, you know, if the if the hazard quotient for a set of chemicals are small, but with the with the idea that there could be substitutions for others that go in and out, um, you know, I think we need to think of it as a snapshot that can change, um, and that's that's I think very difficult part of this. How do how do you look at things that could be changing and. I I agree with <coughs> Mike's interpretation of, of the charge that the, the uh, permanently banned phthalates, uh, there's, I interpret this text here such that uh, there's probably no option, there's no option for us to say, oh, they can be uh, reopened or permanent ban will stay. So, in other words, that means we have to focus our efforts on the phthalates that are um, covered by the interim ban, and we have to focus our efforts on those um, that aren't mentioned at all. So, I, I guess the first question would be which of those uh, uh, covered by the interim ban, um, in our opinion, would qualify um, upgrade it into a permanent ban, and by what criteria yeah. are we doing it? So oh. that, I mean, that, I'm saying that so we can focus the discussion. We don't need to discuss much the permanently banned anymore. Yep. Does, does everyone agree on that? Yeah. I mean, in Holger's slide, the last slide, he made a good case for the three permanently banned ones. The data are there. I think we all agree that that's case yeah. he also made a case that DNI NP should go from interim ban to banned is the, that's I think where we should start a discussion that what criteria are we going to use to support that if that's the proposal I'd like to open that discussion mm -hmm. 
In doing so, can I can I make a couple of suggestions to group the the criteria which uh, which Bernie has has elaborated? Can we perhaps turn to slide number one? Mm -hmm. I think this is, uh, this is extremely helpful. The first uh, criterion is, is basically a risk assessment. Um, the second one is the question of relevance, the third, adversity. And then there are a couple of criteria which uh, relate to the quality of, of the studies, the quality of the evidence, and so on. Can I suggest to lump all this together uh, under the umbrella of um, weight of evidence? Well, weight of evidence in chemical risk assessment is not a uniform and unified approach. The epidemiologists are dealing with this in slightly different ways. But these are uh, weight of evidence can mean uh, judge the quality of the toxicological studies by various criteria. There are, there are established ways of doing that. Um, so, uh, can, I, can I suggest we, we, we follow these, these well paths, which are concepts that are worked out? Other? It's, it's just for. Levels we don't have to change it now, but. Would levels of human exposure be in the weight of evidence? No. That seems separate. Uh, there the, the so are various not weights of evidence approaches. Uh, one way of, of saying so is, for example, in epidemiology, you, uh, you know, before before you state, okay, there's uh, there's probably evidence of of ad adverse effects in humans uh, based on epidemiology. You would, you know, some people demand at least two independently conducted epidemiological studies. There are quality criteria to judge these epidemiological studies, etc. Et yeah. And uh, similarly, in, uh, with experimental toxic toxicity studies, there are also uh, fairly well-described quality criteria for judging those. I can pick them up, I have them somewhere in my computer. So, uh, criteria, for example, would be simply, first of all, the number of animals used. Um, was this a GLP-type study, uh, either GLP or similar? quality of the endpoints, technical quality, etc. And then questions such as, uh, is this just one study? Is it a, yeah, what do we do, for example, if there's only one study, although well conducted? Do we require evidence from two independently conducted? Questions like this. Why don't we, do you, do you want to make up a new yeah, could, slide? Could do, but it would be, yeah, I can... Um, my computer and knock something up. Yeah. Okay. We don't need to do that now. But okay. So the, the, uh, all I'm suggesting for, for the time being that we separate out these criteria, uh, let's call them operationally weight of evidence, uh, from the question, you know, is this an a adverse effect or adversity is clearly um, an important criterion for us to, to judge. The, the evidence from experimental studies. Uh, and the other important criterion is uh, there is animal models. Are they actually relevant to what we're concerned about in the human? So adversity and relevance are absolutely important criteria. Yes, exposure is, is right. It's how we characterize it. Because the, the question of risk, reflection of the probability of some harm, and that's a function of toxicity and exposure. So the exposure does get plugged in. And if we decided there was no hazard, I mean, the, the, the hazard is not very compelling from the animal studies, and the risk is not very of much concern because of the lack of exposure, we wouldn't be considering a ban. So I don't know how 
openly we want to identify how clearly do we have to say or want to say that exposure is a driving force when it's already captured in risk. We have to make sure that it is captured in risk. I'm not trying to minimize the importance of, of exposure, it's just a character, how we characterize it. I guess what, what, what we have to uh, concern ourselves is uh, situations where some but not all of these criteria are fulfilled. For example, if there's good evidence to think the effects in question are adverse, and if there's good evidence to think that they're relevant for the human, and say good quality studies, but question marks with, with uh, quantifi quantification or quantifiability of risk, what, what do we do then? And for adversity, the, the outcome in a human study could be actually a surrogate for something else. So, for instance, AGD. I mean, that's probably be difficult to argue in and of itself without any other effect. That's a serious adverse. It's, it's an anatomical change, but it's, it's indicating that there was decreased androgen signaling during development. It may have implications for reproductive tract development that's unseen, semen quality later in life, et cetera. So just, just in terms of um, how we define some of the endpoints that may be relevant or important to consider, that the endpoint in and of itself may be a surrogate for something else. Andreas says, do these sort of capture? Yes, I would separate out adversity from hazard risk. Would. Yeah. Because there, there may be a situation where you, where you see, where you can say that clearly from, say, the experimental evidence uh, uh, that you have to conclude the effects in questions are adverse. Uh, but still, um, the risk assessment might say, oh, it doesn't quite reach, uh, the exposure doesn't quite reach the levels of, of doses where we would be concerned. So I would make that a separate criterion. Risk assessment um, as a new, uh, hazard or risk assessment as a new, like, like you have now. Okay. And, and exposure, following what uh, Bernie said, exposure is already uh, part of hazard risk assessment, so can be can be deleted. Are there R's, R's, are there ORs between these, or ANs between these? That that is the question. Yes, that's the question. Some feed into each other. I mean, I I could almost see. I mean, thinking from an epidemiologic perspective, you would start off with outcome, where adversity is. You know, what is the outcome? Is it an adverse outcome? Is it serious? You know, is it a surrogate for something else? And then exposure, you know, what are the levels of exposure? How well, you know, just speaking about it, human studies, how well is exposure measured? Is it measured at the relevant time <laughs> point? Are levels high enough, et cetera, that you would expect to see an association? And then you put the exposure and the outcome together to look at a, a association, a relative risk, et cetera, which would be comparable in this case almost, you know, not strictly speaking, but, you know, hazard of what you're trying to, to do. So I think from an epidemiologic perspective, you know, you could think that, you know, you have your outcome, your exposure. Um, and then your association, which in this case is kind of equivalent in a way analogy to a hazard risk where you're bringing both exposure and outcome. Because in, in a human study, for instance, if you have an adverse outcome and you've measured exposure at the wrong time or you've measured the wrong metabolite at the wrong exposure, obviously you're not going to see an association. And in this case, you're not going to conclude there's a risk because you've so, I mean, it, it's just a different perspective. Uh, 
But I think what I'm trying to say, and maybe I'm not saying it very well, um, it seems to me that the hazard risk may be a, a, the highest bar, if we're thinking about a hazard index there. I'm thinking about the risk side of that, I guess. Um, recognizing that, that exposures change as patterns change, as behavior change, whatever. Um, you know, if, would we meet the, the band criteria if we had adverse outcome, evidence of exposure, it was a relevant problem, the quality of the studies was good. But maybe the hazard index risk evaluation doesn't quite, how high does it have to be? Because I don't think, again, I, I think the data can change so much with substitutions that we, how do we evaluate that? We have a snapshot that may be dominant by some, one or more chemicals and others at a particular case may be very low, but as some go out, some go up and. Um, we have to do it with what we have right now. Exposure levels, you're mm -hmm. saying? Yeah. I mean, we, we can, you know, indicate in our narrative that things may and probably will change and that, you know, that may change our interpretation, but that's beyond our control in terms of our recommendation that we have to make now in April. What you're saying kind of is if you calculate your hazard index or your risk and your numerator and denominator can change either one or, or neither or both. And if you calculate it and it comes out to, you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.2, you know, whatever, and then it goes into, you know, no action category, et cetera, then if the exposure then comes up, right, and then the new calculation will be it's at one or exceeding one, right? I mean, and, that's... Right, and that's the thing that's bothering me is because, you know, we haven't looked at, at our chapter yet, but, um, you know, there are banned chemicals that have very low hazard quotients. Current data set. Now, that doesn't mean it's permanent. Yeah, one could argue that's the effect of the ban. It was before the ban. 2005 and 6 data. Butyl benzyl, or which is, I mean, is it one of the three? Yeah. Two of the three. I think there's also a, another question, and maybe this is adjacent to yours, Chris. There's a question of how wide we look for hazard as we consider making any recommendations. And the example that I would give, we have focused largely on the phthalate syndrome in the rat, but there are some of these chemicals that cause an effect when adult males are exposed, and it affects sperm quality, which isn't part of the phthalate syndrome is the exposure is out of the window that we've been talking about. So you've got adult men working in a plant exposed to high levels of some phthalate, they end up with decreased sperm quality. Are we going, is that in our window? Would we ban a chemical because of that? If it met all of the other criteria? Or are we narrowly focused on the phthalate syndrome and we're only concerned about the fetal exposure and the consequences in the neonate. Reference doses have been chosen for the latter. In the latter case for the phthalate syndrome. Then we argued that that would be a conservative value for infants. So we used the same. 
My point is that, I mean, we felt comfortable saying the banned chemicals are banned without even looking at the hazard index. So it met in our mind some kind of a cutoff that. Um, yes, and I, I agree with that. So <clears throat> I'm not even thinking of this in the context of one of the three that's banned. I'm thinking of other chemicals where we would be forced to make a decision of changing it from interim to full or making a decision on something that isn't banned at all at this point, but what it would look like if we left a chemical out of regulatory recommendations, out, outside of the scope of any recommendations that caused infertility in adult men, adult males, but it didn't cause the phthalate syndrome. So we took it off. We we put it aside and said we're not going to make a decision about that when in fact men are still exposed in the plant and are having low sperm counts or low quality of sperm and we didn't do anything about it. So are you saying that if in the case, it's almost like the ban, by, by having these banned chemicals as sort of case, cases to look at, I mean it, if we don't find evidence that of uh, maybe in the, the risk evaluation of uh, the distribution of the hazard index being high enough that it met this criterion of, you know, around one, that then we would go look at other out, outcomes that could potentially be part of this? So, because what I'm saying is, if we've done that for the banned chemicals, then that, wouldn't that set the same stage for what we do for the ones that we haven't looked at yet? My comment now might sound contrary to what I just said a minute ago, but this to some extent, the scope of the field has already been narrowed for us because the concern is what is what phthalates are present in plastic products to which infants are exposed. So does that give us license to ignore the, the possibility that exposure of adults may cause a change in sperm quality because it's out of the scope of exposure of children to plas plastic products that have phthalates? I mean, the children's products is the bottom line, but it all, you know, the, the chart says you have to consider cumulative exposure uh, from all phthalates, all sources, and from, you know, pregnant women and other sensitive groups, I guess, I guess is the word. Um, didn't specify what who they were, but, um, you know, I don't think it's off the table to consider that. On the other hand, um, I think before yesterday, you know, I thought it was a similar mode of action. Now, I don't know, or I'm not so sure. And Chris, I'm not suggesting that if, if we make our first cut on the phthalate syndrome consequences of exposure that we then have to open the door up again and say, is there anything else out there? Because we have already, in the writings that we've done, we've kind of said that, you know, there are other toxic effects of phthalates that involve a carcinogenic response that we're worried about in rodents and hepatotoxicity and some effect on the kidney, potentially. I'm not saying that we should go back and now do another committee activity reviewing anything, some toxicities other than Phthalate syndrome. I don't think we're, I think we've already put that aside. Exposure during the relevant window, but outcomes that are unclear whether it's part of the phthalate syndrome, for instance, the neurodevelopmental outcomes in children. So those are prenatal exposure during the appropriate window and also early life exposure. But, you know, they're in the epi studies, you know, the six or so, let's say, that have looked at the neurodevelopmental outcomes, it's epi. So they're not looking at mechanism. It's an association. So it's unclear. Is it through, you know, reduced androgens during <clears throat> fetal development affecting, you know, brain development, programming, et cetera, or not? I mean, that's not even approached in those studies. But it's the relevant window, different outcome. So I think we would be remiss if we didn't make some kind of a statement that there 
are potential consequences of exposure during that critical time that are outside the phthalate syndrome and they shouldn't be ignored. Reflection of our state of knowledge today. Focusing on the phthalate syndrome because that's, that's where the data is and where it's thought to be the most sensitive response. But recognizing that there are other outcomes responses. No, but I mean just, just putting it down clearly why that was chosen and it, it's not that there's nothing else to look at, but why? I mean, I think that gets to the point of, you know, we were looking at DDP and saying, well, it may have, you know, distribution low currently, or 2005 and six data, but we didn't feel comfortable about saying, oh, that's a good chemical, let's keep it. There's something in our heads that's saying there are other things about that other than just this risk evaluation. My point is whatever we did there, that's what we can also do in other cases. If I understand what you're saying, Chris, that the, the hazard index analysis is the results are driven in large part by DHP, right? But that's not to say that EBP and fetal benzyl phthalate are not playing any role in that. It's just quantify that. Yep. Um, I mean, it depends on which case you look at. Um, let me look at. Um, case two values for um, the reference doses, the 75th percentile of um, butyl benzyl was 0 0.015 and for 0 0.023. The maximum value is 0 0.12 and 0 0.20. Hazard quotients for those. Mm -hmm. Compared to DEHP, which had a 75th percentile of 0.13, but a maximum value of 7.5. So in terms of, of ratios of, of DHP to DBP, for example, what would they be? Ratio of? The, the maximum hazard quotient. I can't do the math in my head. Is it 10, 10 to 1, 100 to 1? Um, more than 10. I'm trying to get a, a handle on how how we would use the DEHP, which I think does come out as is something that we we would ban based based solely on the hazard index evaluation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so using that, how would we then use it to evaluate DBP and say yes, still we would be that would still be of concern. Um, so it's tenfold less or whatever it is. Chris, what you're, what you're also getting at too is these three are permanently banned and you have a, a number mathematical hazard quotient that is less than the criteria that we'd be using for the other three, right? So it, it doesn't seem have to be consistent, consistent right? 
Well, but if I look back at the exposure table, the DEHP is, th is 10 times the exposure levels at the median um, than BBP. So if exposure for BBP got to that same place as DEHP, you're going to have the same problem. And that's the, that's the point. I don't, you know, this is a very sta static analysis that is trying to represent something that's very dynamic. You're making two points, the one with the exposure being dynamic and changing, and then I think the other is, I mean, just hypothetically, if there were only two permanently banned and dibutyl or butylbenzyl was in the interim ban, based on those numbers, what would the recommendation be, right? Because the hazard quotient would, would in most cases, or clearly be below one. Right? I mean, is right. that kind of... Right. And so we're applying that criteria to the others. Is that fair or consistent? Right. Coming back to why we started this discussion an hour ago about some criteria for making a decision. And I think, Andreas, your suggestion is, is helpful to back us away from, for example, an automatic decision that if, it, if the HI is less than one, then it's not banned. It, it's one of the things that we would consider and we consider hazard, we consider risk, and we consider the adversity, severity, all of these other characteristics, but there isn't any one of those that would force us into a decision about banning status. It's the composite of that, and that's why this exercise was relegated to a, a, a group of experts as opposed to somebody who would just calculate some numbers and take a slip of paper to the commission and say, Here, here's what it is. Respond to it. But I think we, we are here because this is, it's, it's more than gut feel, but it's also a composite of, of information that, that distinguishes above and below a threshold of, of activity. And so it gets to the point where the toxicity information for maybe the banned chemicals are somewhat similar. I mean, in our case, too, we, we set them the same, right? So, I mean, I'm no exposure expert, but it seems to me with the toxicity values that are about the same, high quality, there's, I mean, those three chemicals have been studied a lot. There's a lot of data there to suggest toxic toxicity. So, you know, with a with a exposure values that are within tenfold of what could be a problem that, I, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's, I know it's different than just looking at the hazard index. That's the easy part, but it's, do we, do we try to say something from the exposure studies that have, you know, the exposure modeling? I think that's what's so key about why we, we are so interested in the exposure aspect, uh, because that's the other part of the equation. Um, you know, if, if there's a lot of exposure, then that influences the risk, obviously. And so uh, what we're going to talk about this afternoon is, is going to be an important part of this discussion. Sort of the inform maybe the point I'm trying to get to is the information about how they would substitute for each other. I don't, I don't have a sense of that. Would BBP ever substitute for DEHP or BBP for DEHP? Um, <clears throat> I'm, I have looked into um, the the origin of, of of the European way of of handling this. So there was, uh, you know, just like with the permanent ban here, the three 
thought I'd throw a band in children's toys and uh, children's care products. And then uh, those that are, uh, have an interim ban here are banned in the European Union, but only if the toys, in toys, but only if they can be taken directly into the mouth. So that that's, is not uh, what's happening here in the U.S., that there's instead an interim ban. Well, but it, it, the interim ban only applies to child care articles and toys that can fit in a child's mouth. Okay, fine. So that's, a, that's an analogy there. Um, these these um, recommendations or this kind of action in Europe was based on various risk assessment uh, uh, reports by uh, various EU scientific committees. And uh, what I'm now trying to find out is what they mean by risk assessment, precisely, and whether, whether that really means a quantitative risk assessment in the sense of uh, what, what we've just discussed a couple of minutes ago, or, you know, risk assessment can mean all sorts of things doesn't necessarily mean um, you, you require that a, that a hazard quotient is, uh, is smaller than one. So I'm trying to find out. So there's evidence that there's exposure. There's evidence, good toxicology data on chemicals across something that could be the phthalate syndrome, and it could be even broader than that. I mean, that all leads to discomfort in continuing or dropping the ban, right? Which is not based on a number of the hazard index. Uh, the ban was not based on a risk assessment. I mean, the, this is the risk assessment, I think. Um, that's what they, why they, part of the reason why they told us to convene a CHAP. But looking, at, I, I was also looking at the, the origins of the EU ban, and, and one of the things they mentioned, well, if you take, uh, um, you know, if you allow, uh, you, you take one away and allow the others in, I mean, if you were to say, well, maybe the exposure from one of the banned ones is low, but if you say, okay, you can use it because the risk is low, and then, you know, what's the risk if they begin to use it? It's a different scenario than <clears throat> um, maybe chemicals like DEP that have high exposures, and maybe we don't have enough evidence yet on the toxicity of it, but it sounds like DEP is not as toxic as these. If we had our rathers, maybe that's what we would prefer well, compared to. At least in rats, it's less toxic. Another point that isn't essentially one of these criteria but a, a thought of concern that has arisen several times as we've discussed the impact of a regulatory decision is that it may take some of the bad actors off the scene and replace them with chemicals of unknown behavior, un, unknown toxicity, unknown exposure, except that they would probably have an exposure similar to the ones that are being taken out by a regulatory action. And I'm pretty sure that CPSC doesn't have the authority to demand that certain types of toxicity studies be done before a chemical replacement is, is decided upon by industry. So we, we, can't make that a rec we can't make that a recommendation as such with the expectation that it's going to happen, but we may choose to be on the record of recommending that alternates be selected only on the basis of known toxicity profile that would make them of less concern than the ones they're replacing. 
But I think simply from the public health standpoint, th that's an important message to give rather than take a replacement and do the experiment in humans to find out if it's better or worse than the one that we're replacing. So I don't know how that's going to play out in the report, but I, I'm just putting a, a marker there that I would like to have us go on the record of making some recommendation of that kind in the report. And another <clears throat> another recommendation in my mind would be to to um, sort of have some some pressure for the agencies to work across, you know, have the EPA, the FDA, the CPSC work together. I know, <laughs> but I mean, it, because it really, in terms of public health, it's not just one product at a time or one cosmetic at a time. It needs to be thought of together. Um, and I know that's difficult, but. My, my thinking is we're doing more of a public health risk assessment, not just based on toys. And I mean, I, it's an excellent idea. I mean, just for the record, we are uh, have a lot of interactions, cooperation, and sharing going on with EPA, FDA, and, um, Health Canada, NTP, I mean, there is a lot of crosstalk, um, but there's always, you know, opportunities to do more than that, yeah. I think it's time for a break. Uh, reconvene about uh, quarter to 11. Okay. <laughs>